Thank you, and uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, attend today. I'm never quite sure of what words to use when we're talking about a virtual uh, meeting, but uh, I'll use attend anyway. And um, hopefully uh, you'll get something out of this. Um, I always find that the, the Q&A is probably more important than a presentation, and uh, very happy to try to answer any questions anyone might have, um, or indeed, take any comments uh, on board that you have. Um, so I, I might say that uh, we're coming towards the end of the consultation period. Um, I think it's next Thursday, perhaps. The day I've lost track of dates at this stage, but it's the 30th of April is um, the, the final day at noon. Uh, we want to get as many uh, submissions as possible. Um, and uh, it's kind of why I'm leaving this first screen open uh, while I'm talking, because um, I know these things can sound a bit corny about RCs, our plan, but I, I, I genuinely, and I think that's, uh, I'm saying that on behalf of the department, uh, government, our advisory group, everything, like we really want this to be um, a broad plan that covers as many people's uh, desires and needs and wants as possible. And therefore, we want people to be saying, well, this is our plan. Um, so this, the consultation and uh, next week's close brings to an end two and a half years of consultation. So even though this is a draft plan and even though the consultation uh, has, this phase of the consultation has been ongoing since um, November, uh, we have been touring the country for, you know, almost oh, almost two and a half years. Um, we've met people at kitchen tables. We've hosted big, reasonably sized seminars. Um, we've had fights. <laughs> we've had de great debates. Um, and, you know, it, it, it feels like this is, I think, a consultation we can stand over. Um, but that's not to say that I'm not encouraging people to keep talking to us. Um, once the consultation ends, it doesn't mean that that's the last time you'll hear from us. Um, I, I think I, I recognise quite a few faces and quite a few names on the, the, the grid there. And um, we've been talking to these people outside of the formal consultation period and taking on board uh, views and ideas and concerns. Um, and I hope they will be replicated in an iterative process on this framework. Um, so look at, uh, I'll just go through it um, and what my intention here is and the intention of uh, this presentation uh, as it has been given over the last uh, three or four months is to try and cut out the work for you in terms of uh, reading through word for word the NMPF and just to give you a good idea of how we've structured it, why we've structured it in a certain way and where we're coming from and possibly uh, the direction of travel that we're going in. Um, so look at the framework itself, it's a long-term planning document. It covers the next um, 20 years. Um, I'm going to show you a screen in a couple of um, slides time that shows you how this is a parallel to what has been up until this point, uh, as in pre-COVID, has been a very successful framework, the National Planning Framework. Um, the reason why it's been successful is it sets out over a long-term period um, government investment uh, in terms of the National Development Plan aligned to a spatial strategy. So uh, what investment is going to be made, uh, where it's going to be made, how it's going to be made, when it's going to be made, um, and aligning that to the geographical spread, uh, the projection of needs, um, and that's uh, that is something of mirror. That is something we've tried to mirror in the National Marine Planning Framework. Hence the name National Marine Planning Framework, and not Marine Spatial Plan. Um, and I think it's fair to say that uh, the aforementioned National Planning National um, Development Plan uh, will probably be probably be the next phase of uh, the National Marine Planning Framework um, in whatever phase or whatever uh, guise that comes um, and more on that uh, and on. Um, so the approach we've taken is rather than uh, construct a map 
based spatial plan. We've done it according to policy. So we have um, basically toured uh, the government departments and state agencies, uh, discussed policies, um, some of which were very mature uh, and took very little kind of um, uh, fleshing out from us in terms of putting it straight into National Marine, the NMPF. Others uh, hadn't been matured and really looked at a, you know, for a long time, if ever. And we've attempted to kind of shape them um, and given them some kind of structure. Um, there are others that I'd love to have brought a little bit further. And I'm, I'm hoping by the time the final plan comes out towards the end of the year, we will have um, brought them further. Uh, I suppose brought them some distance along the way. And the one that would jump to mind there would be uh, seaweed uh, policy. Um, we don't have a mature one. And uh, that's something we want to work on, even though seaweed isn't part of our remit as a department of planning. But um, it is the remit of government. Um, this document will be the critical basis, uh, one of them, a few different ones, but, but it should be the first port of call for decision makers into the future. So um, in terms of what can happen where and when, um, any decision maker needs to make themselves aware of that when looking at uh, an application from a developer. Um, also, right now, um, all policy makers, all plans, all files, all, all applications under the 2018 Planning and Development Act are five, I think. Um, right now, they have to meet, they, their plans has to meet the conditions set in the NMPF, even though we're not at final stage of the NMPF, but it's already legislated for. Um, so in that way, it will be the number one document for all decision makers on that, or developers. Um, and it finally, it gives us the mechanism for a special designation, which we haven't worked out right now. Uh, and uh, generally, that's the question I, I get at these events. Uh, when are you going to zone and how? what shape will that zone take? We will be working on that over the next couple of years. Um, and in terms of the legal underpinning for that, that isn't yet in place and that will be in place through the Marine Planning and Development Management Bill, which will hopefully be coming through in the next 12 months. Okay, uh, so Marine Special Planning brings together, like a jigsaw, uh, different multiple users of an ocean, tries to fit them in together and ensure that there's a sustainable balance uh, across the three. Uh, air, pillars of uh, economic, um, environmental and social uh, sustainability. Um, the overriding directive uh, from Europe is called the MSP directive. It has been transposed into the aforementioned Act, uh, part five, there we go. And that's just fleshing out in legal terms what I had mentioned uh, a minute ago in terms of the obligations of bodies to take into account the MSP. Um, Obviously, my minister has been uh, designated as the, the appropriate authority for that, uh, which is the reason why I'm the person sitting here talking today. Um, and it probably makes sense that the Department of Responsibility for Planning uh, are the department who are designated as the ones responsible for marine planning. Um, and I, I always like to say uh, as well that we probably are quite objective in our viewpoint on this um, because we don't have any major policy um, area uh, in part of the 16 sectoral ones which I'll outline in a minute except for wastewater treatment um, but we don't we don't do aquaculture we don't do fishing we don't do um, we don't deal with national parks and wildlife service directly so therefore I think we can stand aside and say objective how we've approached this so the area, you're all familiar with this, it's uh, just shy of half a million kilometers, high water mark out uh, almost uh, nautical miles. Um, and this is going to be, this has been brought together over a hundred years, I suppose, of legislation. Um, and it's going to be consolidated in a marine jurisdiction bill, which I had expected later on this year, but I've no idea when that will be now. Um, but I'd hope soon enough, and the Department of Foreign Affairs will be the, the body who will be pushing that one out. So the Maritime Jurisdiction Bill, I'd keep an eye out uh, for that if I were you, and that should give us the, the legal underpinning that's already there, but to bring it into one place. Um, and uh, 
So, a planning system. So what do I mean by a planning system? There's three components to any good planning system. And you might have your own thoughts on how the land planning system works, but nevertheless, uh, it works under three headings. Forward planning, which is what uh, a 20 year plan is. Uh, development management, which is your consent procedures. And enforcement, which uh, is a the very unsexy part of planning in a way. Um, it's a uh, chasing up on licensing conditions and monitoring and compliance. Etc. So they are well established parts and pieces of the land planning um, system carried out by various bodies such as local authorities and on board Panala. Um, whereas marine planning, uh, none of that really takes place in a coordinated way. Uh, we have no forward planning framework. Uh, there's multiple development management systems under various agencies such as ourselves on the foreshore. Um, and it reflects the diverse range of activities and there are multiple enforcement regimes and in some cases enforcement doesn't really happen in a lot of these places. So I suppose part of my role will be to look at each of those things in turn and um, really try to bring shape to them um, so they, they work in a consistent, efficient and transparent uh, manner. Um, so the forward planning part is this, the National Marine Planning Framework. The development management system, part of that will be uh, solved, if I can use that word, um, through the aforementioned MPDM bill, uh, which will bring about a more efficient development management system, um, particularly for offshore renewable energy. Um, but there are other areas that will be reviewing these kind of things as well, such as aquaculture, um, possibly ports, uh, development, dredging, all those kind of things. And then the enforcement regime is a bit of a conundrum. Um, it works very well in some places, it doesn't work in others, and I will be bringing some something um, together over the next two to three months, I hope, um, that will bring some sort of consistency to that area. So uh, I promised you this slide. Uh, I know you've all been waiting for it. Um, so on the land planning side is the right-hand side. Um, so if we can ignore, ignore the left for now, um, so we have our overarching government policy, which is made up of uh, legislation, um, a, the program for government, European directives. Uh, so that's a bit of a catch all phrase to cover all of those things. Um, and flowing from that, uh, we would have had the 2015, I could be wrong, 2014, 2015 planning policy statement, which set out the direction of travel for the land planning system over the next six years, so to 21, and it will be reshaped and redrafted at that point and put out public consultation. In the same way, we have released a marine planning policy statement, which sets the direction of travel for all marine planning policy over a six year period. That was launched in, I think, for consultation around May of last year, and it was signed off post consultation by government on November the 12th. Uh, of 2019 and that's in play right now. It mainly sets the direction of travel I suppose in particular for the National Marine Planning Framework, um, Marine Protected Areas, uh, the Marine Planning Development Management Bill um, over a six-year period and we will be reviewing that in year five and it'll go out to public consultation again uh, circa 2024-25. Flowing from back over to the right hand side, flowing from the planning policy statement, then we have the National Planning Framework. I'm sure everybody here is familiar with the National Planning Framework. Um, I mentioned it already. It's part of Project Ireland 2040. And it's a, I suppose if you picture a circle in your, in your head, on one side of that circle is the National Planning Framework. On the other side of that circle is the National Development Plan. Take the circle as a whole, that is Project Ireland 2040. Um, so that's a model we could use if we wanted to, and if, if, if we thought appropriate for, um, for this sort of uh, forward planning. So likewise, we have a national marine planning framework that uh, sits alongside as a sister document of the national planning framework. And it's important to say a sister document, not a child document of the national planning framework, but it, it gives it equal uh, status. Um, now, this is where the kind of di divergence uh, occurs uh, from that. So, when we go down to the regional levels, 
Um, so I'll skip through, I'll, I'll fly through the, uh, the planning side first, the land planning side. So flowing from the national planning framework, which is the national viewpoint, you would have regional, spatial and economic uh, strategies, um, which really are the, the babies of um, the uh, regional uh, authorities. Um, they take the national strategy and align their own strategy for their region, uh, which is usually five or six different local authorities or counties and align it to corporate plans and make sure that the will of uh, of the people, the government, are, is is aligned to the practice of development plans at a, a, a regional level. Uh, likewise, what flows from those regional plans are local development plans, local to each county council, local authority. And again, um, that the, the, the flow of knowledge goes upwards in terms of the top um, showing the umbrella uh, structure and the local authority plan feeding from the top and bringing it to a, and localizing that national strategy. And just as an aside, it's the role of the office of the planning regulator to make sure that those plans are aligned uh, together from top to bottom. Uh, recently established OPR, of course. Um, and then finally, local area plans, which be sub county level, um, usually done by municipal district, but certain so sometimes done by, you know, um, just an area that isn't a, a, a municipal district as such. Okay, back to the marine side then. This will be the next phase of the National Marine Planning Framework and we'll, we have been discussing this with our advisory group and I'll mention the advisory group again later on and this is something we'll be talking um, over the next hopefully few months to them about how we're going to implement the broad National Marine Planning Framework. Well, it's, it strikes me that you can't have a national plan for an area the size of what, that Ireland has in terms of half a, half a million square kilometres we're probably going, we are going to have to have sub-national plans. Um, now, what shape they will take, there is no decision made on that. Um, if I was pushed for it, I'd probably say that we'll have about three regional plans, probably. Um, but the main area of interest I would have, um, and this isn't a personal thing, but I think it's, a, it's an appropriate for this sort of thing, is a community-led approach. Um, uh, so coastal partnerships. And I'd hope to, uh, roll uh, a couple of these out as pilot projects over the next uh, few months. Um, we've been delayed in that aspect, as everything has been delayed by the current emergency. But I would hope that um, we, in the background, we are looking to make progress on these. And these will be local plans. Um, I suppose if I could suggest one picture of it, it would be like an advisory group at a local level representing various industries and um, interest groups uh, trying to iron out issues and challenges that that locality faces. And the reason why I suppose I think this could be a good indication of how the future of marine planning or certainly a strong element and an important element of the future of marine planning is, is that um, the topography uh, changes in every place. So where I live in, in Wexford is incredibly different to the seascape of Mayo or to the Bay Area of Bantry uh, and so on and so forth around the country. So it's important that the, there is a local aspect to these plans. And um, hopefully now we can get those up and running in the next uh, few months. Um, so the team that I lead, we have uh, quite a broad responsibility area. Um, so apart from the NMPF, we also do foreshore consenting. Um, and the enforced side of that. Um, the, the group that has that we've uh, really leaned on over the last couple of years has been an advisory group chaired by my minister, the Minister uh, for Urban Development, uh, Damien English, um, and he's responsible for marine planning. And that advisory group has been um, an incredible source of knowledge for us and guidance along the way. And uh, we'll be in touch with, I know a few of those, uh, I'm not just promising people who are on this uh, call, but I, I genuinely mean that. And we'll be hoping to um, reinstate that advisory group very shortly to discuss next phases of, of this plan. And that advisory group um, is made up of people from the economic uh, environment, uh, social 
commercial pillars as well as public sector organizations who have relevant uh, input into this um and I, I, unless anybody on the the line wants to disagree with me i think everybody has been given a very fair uh, voice at that and an equal voice around the table it isn't it hasn't been led by any one industry or any uh, one activity um it has been really well balanced um, and something we're quite proud of uh, in that respect um the marine legislation steering group uh, has had input that's across the environmental group talking about all marine legislation but obviously the mpdm has particular relevance for ourselves and uh, they have led uh, out on that uh, even though it's our department who actually um are doing the work uh, in terms of bringing the bill through um and the marine institute again invaluable in the support they've given us um with their advice and scientific support um and uh, the sea and AA, which are out Right now for consultation alongside the nmpf uh, rps were undertaken uh, to to do that um okay so the actual structure of the plan and i'm looking at the time here and by the looks of it this is going to be a long presentation but I, so I'll, I'll, I'll speed up don't worry um yeah just to give you a time call oh sorry uh, we have been it's just a 15 minute mark. okay 15 my god okay um so the actual structure of the plan itself um is uh, we have overarching marine planning policies and these will kind of uh, everything flows into these three big areas and we all know what they are they're the sustainable development uh, pillars um and i will make a brief uh, note on this um that from the environmental side a uh, one feedback we got in the original public consultation from the baseline report was it hadn't been fleshed out enough and i think that's one big change from our original baseline of 2018 to our draft nmpf of now um it's also the first one you come to um and perhaps that's something i'll be reflecting on when we uh, revise the contents page but when you go through the page the environmental one stands out straight as the first one not the economic or not the social the environmental so i'm not just trying to play to the gallery there but i, I think it's an important point to make um so the overarching ones of which there are three start uh, the nmpf and then we move on to sector specific policies which go through the primary activities not and they're not every activity that takes place there but it's the primary ones that take place so just look at a brief note i don't plan on going through uh, each of these but they're, they're the headings we've uh, given to the environmental, social and economic uh, pillars. Um, so, okay, so the planning policies themselves uh, are directions to decision makers and to planners that they must conform to in order for um, their development application to go through, if you like. Um, so, I, I don't I, I'm, going, I'm I'm conscious of time and I'm not going to read through each of these but I would tr I would prompt you uh, and ask you to pick up the NMPF and look through this part of it uh, even if you only read the planning policies you will get enough from it to understand where we're going with this um, okay they're aligned to the MSFD uh, uh, you all know these things the GES descriptors are all included and all that and we we work very closely with marine environment which is also in our department um, to come up with these things uh, so I just give me an ocean health example here proposals and a proposal can be a file a plan marine uh, policy uh, it doesn't have to be just a development application it's all of the above proposals that reduce the risk of introduction or spread of invasive sorry my own screen is uh, i can't see the whole lot of it there we are uh, proposals must demonstrate a risk management approach to prevent introduction or spread of invasive non-indigenous species um particularly when and you've got two things there okay so that's protection of the the marine environment as it is and that if you go through each of the marine planning policies you'll see that we're trying to protect it here if you think it should be bolstered let us know okay um the climate change one is obviously very important as well and we've quite a few there on climate change uh, which reflect the current um, prioritization of uh, climate change um, which is temporarily halted uh, but uh, over the last few months has uh, gained a uh, rightful relevance um, we back all these things up with maps uh, of which there are many and we will be developing new maps for the final plan 
that one there shows the National Marine sediments uh, that store carbon. Um, okay, so the nitty gritty of this plan really, I think, uh, is the sector marine planning policies. So these flow from the, the overarching three. As I said, we have 16 sectors represented here. These are what we have come up with as the primary uh, sectors. And we have had one eye on Europe. Um, so there, it's not, we haven't aligned ourselves totally with the norm uh, for, for each European member state, but we've used language to, to make sure that there's a coherence between them all. And that covers off transboundary issues, etc. cetera. Um, so there you are, aquaculture to fisheries, marine aggregates to wastewater treatment. Um, as I said, it doesn't, it, it covers most things um, there. Um, and I want to give you a couple of examples of uh, one or two of these and how they read. So we have 11 planning policies for offshore renewable energy. Uh, we state very clearly on this, that, and these are directions for decision makers, um, proposals that assist uh, the state in meeting the government's target of generating at least, at least three and a half gigawatts of offshore renewable energy by 2030, propose to maximise a long-term shift from use of fossil fuels to renewable electricity in line with decarbonisation targets should be supported. The reason why I'm reading that out is we've tried to read it, write it as plainly as possible. So decision makers can't be in two minds as to what we're saying here and what government are saying here. Um, we want offshore renewable energy, government have stated that they want it. We want the decarbonisation of fuel and energy and uh, we're, we're instructing decision makers uh, to follow that. Um, so there we go, each policy is accompanied by supporting material, uh, if not the policy itself, then the legislation that it's, that's taken from it, and in some cases both. Um, there's also a direction of travel for each of them, and we have included as many maps as possible uh, to show where activities are taking place. And in fact, hopefully for the final one, uh, but certainly on an iterative basis, we'll be showing where activities will be taking place where they're not taking place already. Um, so what's happening next? And uh, we have quite a busy period uh, coming up. So we will be developing statutory marine planning guidelines on offshore renewable energy. I don't know if anyone here was involved in the wind, the land wind guidelines or has looked at them, um, but they will be similar to those, but for offshore. And they will be out to public consultation when we're finished them. Uh, we won't be releasing those until the MPDM bill has passed because we don't have the legislative um, footing to, to do that, but we will be working on them so that shortly after the MPDM is enacted, we will uh, be bringing those out along with broad development management uh, guidelines. And this would reflect normal for a planning system. You have planning guidelines for developers and decision makers and authorities to refer to, and it uh, really is uh, the nitty gritty of the whole system. Um, we'll be looking at a uh, devolving, um, we might, we may not, marine planning uh, to local authorities. Again, I mentioned it before, the coastal partnerships and regional planning. We're looking at that at the moment and we'll be discussing that with our advisory group and with appropriate authorities as to how we're going to actually implement that. Um, we are remapping the near shore at the moment and that's probably going to be a three-year project. Um, a very difficult project to do. In some cases, it hasn't been done in over 100 years. Um, so uh, more on that uh, at some other stage. My plan for the Marine, uh, so we're working with uh, the Marine Institute and other um, bodies to construct, um, uh, you know, I don't know if any of you are, are, are familiar with my plan, but this will be like the, uh, the real atlas, the, the atlas of uh, the sea and where development has taken place, where applications are being received, uh, where shipping lanes are. So this will be the spatial, uh, tangible part of the, the plan, uh, where policies are, where marine protected areas are, SACs. Um, it doesn't exist at the moment. It exists, some of it exists in pockets or that various agencies or authorities are doing great work on it. We want to bring all of that work together and create a one-stop shop for all of this information. And ideally, and we will do this, um, we will release that to the public and everybody will have access to that. Um, 
we are currently doing some education programs up for local authority planners because this the local authorities who will be involved in this and um, this is brand new for them um, and plus part of our remit will be education program for citizens as well um, i'm really looking forward to that part of it um, so that's your uh, you breathe a sigh of relief i'm at the end um, but the draft NMPF, just a recap, was launched on the 12th of November. Um, it, the consultation is ending on the 30th of April. There are four documents altogether that are out for consultation. The NMPF itself, the Strategic Environment Assessment, the Appropriate Assessment and Natura um, Impact Statement. I was going to say Information Impact Statement. Um, they're all on, on our website. Uh, we have been doing regional events. Uh, there's three mentioned there because this is an older slide. Um, but I think we've done 14 sessions, if not if 15 sessions, including on Tuesday in seven different locations around the country. Um, and that doesn't include the two years prior to that. So we, I think we've really uh, extended ourselves rightly um, and shown uh, what consultation should be about. Um, by going to every part of the country and uh, making ourselves available to talk to people and listen to people and hopefully that will be reflected in the final document. Um, I'm finished. Uh, my side of it anyway, but uh, obviously very open to any question. I'll try and answer questions if I can. If I can't, I'll take note. If you want to make a comment to, if you want to make a criticism, I'm, I'm a big boy, I can take it. Um, but uh, I hope you found out of use. Okay, that's brilliant. Thanks, Connor. That's fantastic. Awesome. Um, sorry, I'm getting a feedback on my end. I was wondering, is that coming up in everyone's or is it just me? Sorry, maybe a yes or no question. Is it okay for everyone? Can everyone hear me okay? There's feedback on it, Kat. So, there's quite a bit of feedback. It sounds okay. awful. Okay. <laughs> That's just my voice. <laughs> well, yours was fine. Just Catherine is uh, has the feedback now. Yeah, it was. It was only me. I think it's. I think that's grand. Um, sorry, I just muted you there for a second, Connor. Um, and okay, so thanks, a million, Connor. That was fantastic. Um, I'm just conscious of time but we did we started about five minutes late so um i think if we if it's okay with you connor if we take about 10 minutes for q a with you that'd be great um so as i said at the start a few people weren't here you can hit the reactions and and raise your hands there's a little hand raising signal in there or you can throw a question down into the chat um and we'll take um if, if there's lots of hands and lots of questions we'll take one one and one so uh, there is a question in there from Sean O'Farrell. Uh, how do you think that the current high intensive agricultural land management within catchments can be altered to move the system to adopt initiatives such as the Bride Project in Cork? Um, that's a very specific question. <laughs> I, um, and I think it's probably for, without trying to uh, uh, pass that on, um, that's, that's uh, something I'd have to discuss with the Department of Agriculture. Um, and it, it, I have to say it's, it's, very, it's very specific. I don't want to comment on it because I don't know about the Bride Project. Um, but I'd be eager to hear about it. And uh, I think this is the sort of thing we want to hear back in our consultation. Um, are there things we're missing that we should be looking at? Uh, so uh, put a paragraph together, Sean, and uh, send it in to us and we'll include it in our consultation. That's as, that's as straight as it can be. <laughs> Brilliant. And Patrick Dunlair? Yeah, uh, Connor, thanks for the for the presentation. Very interesting. Patrick uh, from uh, the Dunlair Sustainable Energy Community. Um, we have, uh, in Dunlair since 2016, uh, been working with uh, SAI through their Community Energy Scheme and uh, have, uh, along the uh, the East Coast, probably from Leighton and County Meath up through into Omeath and in, in County Louth, uh, been retrofitting homes for, for, for better energy. Uh, we have, as a, uh, as a goal down the road, to look at, at generation. And uh, so, obviously, uh, not necessarily 
looking to put uh, 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 wind farms, if you will, out on the coast. But I think they're they're probably in the offing, and and, and Louth is one of those counties I think that's been considered. Now you mentioned a, a national plan there with 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 sub national committees. If I if I got you, would that be somewhere where you think a, a, a community organisation such as yourself or on the the coast would would play a role? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, th that sort of initiative, uh, I uh, would love to see a ground up approach on it. Um, so for one coastal partnership. Uh, they may be very interested in that and very focused on it. And I think the community, the SAI, AI-led community energy scheme is is such a one. I think uh, the only one I'm really, I'm not familiar with the one in, uh, that, that you're talking about there, Patrick, but I am familiar with the one in Aaron Moore. And um, a, one coastal partnership might be very interested in doing that, another mightn't be. Um, and I'd like to see a ground up approach on that. But absolutely, that would be the sort of thing I'd have in mind for those community partnerships or coastal partnerships. Um, and, uh, should we reach out to anyone in particular uh, just to express an interest or, or are we uh, at that stage yet? No, uh, I would encourage you to reach out. You're, you're reaching out to the, to the right person now. Okay. <laughs> um, so like we will be coordinating all of these sort of things. Uh, so uh, get in touch. Very good. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Connor. Thank you. We have another question in the chat from Marion O'Shea. Will offshore renewable energy take impact on biodiversity into account? For example, impact on seabirds, migrating birds? Yes, it will have to take it into account. Um, so again, without trying to read through the planning policies, um, if you have a look at the NNPF, the draft of it, um, there are a lot of policies uh, on that, uh, on biodiversity and the ecosystem and protection of it. So whereas we are encouraging offshore renewable energy because that's what uh, well, we're, we're signed up by government and uh, through European directives as well to go that route. And um, I suppose as a, 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 as a policy maker in that regard, that is the route we want to go because it leads to decarbonisation. But that isn't to say that we just get working on putting turbines in. Uh, the proper environmental analysis, analysis uh, must take place and they must take into account the biodiversity. There are some places that are uh, ready-made almost in inverted commas for uh, wind, wind farms. There are others that aren't um, and we need to know uh, which are which aren't and the proper environmental assessments need to be done on all of those places including the one you mentioned there. And, I'm sorry, not need, must be done, must be carried out. Okay, brilliant. Okay. Uh, so we have uh, two other questions in the chat and then I think that will bring us up to the 10 minutes. Um, so the first, will existing sea use be reviewed? For example, existing aquaculture? And can you say something about ex-border MSP? I presume that's cross-border. Um, cross-border, yeah. Um, Will existing sea use be reviewed? Uh, not in this phase of the, the NNPF, uh, because what we need to do is get it in place first as a, con as a concept and as a reality. Um, but in yes, in the next iteration, and that iteration starts the day we launch the final version. So, um, but at the moment, we will be protecting what's there already. Um, and there's no view on, on, well, that's actually not strictly true because um, as you can tell from oil exploration, that won't be protected. Um, but a, the majority of marine activities, we won't be reviewing their use right now. Um, but as to whether we're encouraging their expansion, uh, that's a different question. Um, the cross-border MSP, uh, Yes, I can. I'd hope I, I, I have a very good relationship with my counterpart in Northern Ireland and in England and Scotland and other places we share borders with. We're part of a group uh, called the Six Administrations um, that has recently been renamed the Six Nations, which I much prefer, um, to discuss transboundary issues. Uh, it's an incredibly sensitive time at the moment uh, for Brexit uh, negotiations um, and I suppose 
we're not strictly in Brexit negotiations, but uh, the negotiations Ireland are having on a bilateral basis with the United Kingdom are sensitive uh, and have are caused by Brexit. Um, there are two areas in particular that need to be solved, two questions, um, and, and they, it's about boundary. Uh, I, no prizes for guessing where those two areas are, um, Carlingford and Foyle. Uh, we will get to it. Um, we, we, uh, we've, as I said, excellent informal and formal relations with our counterparts in Northern Ireland. I would hope that we will align uh, our plans around the border at some point, uh, but given the sensitivity of negotiations at the moment, foreign affairs are the ones who lead out on anything to do with cross-border relations. Um, but I think the British and Irish Council of Ministers is going to play a big part in these sort of things. And in a way, not to be, uh, not everyone to be accused of using words that Boris Johnson has used, but uh, it, that in a way gives a platform for de-dramatising um, the situation. Uh, sorry, a, lo a long answer there to, uh, I should have just said, uh, yes, I can say something about it and I, I hope to have good news in that regard over the next 18 months or so. <laughs> I'll stop now. <laughs> <laughs> Get a bit of depth into, into the answers, good. Um, so there is just one final question, although it is a two-part. Um, is there a timeline for the My Plan for the Marine data to be available publicly, is the first part. Okay. Um, um, I can only give you a suggested one. Um, I've kind of earmarked it as a three-year project um, because it's a huge undertaking and the information architecture that needs to take place for a system of that size and a type um, to sit on is no small, no mean undertaking. Um, and anyone who's involved in any kind of IT project will understand what I mean by that. Um, that's not to say we're building it from scratch because there's an awful lot of learning we can do, but we're talking about systems that don't talk to each other, um, having to learn to communicate with each other. And also, um, one thing that I want, uh, and I haven't worked in the area of, of knowledge management years ago, uh, some, the, the, a test I always apply for these things is confidence and trust. So when the end user, the citizen, uh, goes to use this product, um, they need to trust that this is accurate information, it's up to date, and that it's useful to them. Uh, so uh, trust and confidence are the two main things. That takes a while to build a system like that. Um, so I've kind of put three years on it. And for some, um, for some things, we won't have it done in three years. Uh, so if you even take the 16 sectoral activity areas, if we were to take all data from those, that's going to be a multi-year project. But what I want to do is to add to it as we go along. So get it out, get, it, get what we can made publicly available um, as soon as possible, probably in two years to three years, and then add to that as we go along, rather than waiting for the Big Bang approach in five, six years, which may never take place uh, if, we, if we go down that road. So um, I'll say three, I'd hope sooner, but um, uh, you know, uh, pecunium infinitum. If, if I had lots of money and lots of resources, I would uh, have it done in six months. But I don't. <laughs> no problem. And then the, the second part of my question, and I know this has gone over the 10 minutes and there's another few questions that came in, so apologies to those we didn't get around to. Uh, but the second part of that question then was how will local authorities planning sections be resourced so they have the capacity to deal with applications and will on board Planala be the appeal body for marine planning? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I, I, it, it, dep it depends. I hate answering a question, but it depends. But it depends on the shape and the model that we roll out marine planning with. And I, I'll give you an example of uh, you know two or three different models. Um, we could go down a shared service route uh, with local authorities. It could be that one local authority, excuse me, takes. Um, takes on the role of forward planning for five or six marine uh, uh, planning uh, or, uh, local authorities. In that case, you would save on resources and you're centralizing knowledge and that's probably a preferred option. Um, is there a case to be made also for a model whereby we have one central marine planning uh, uh, body uh, who does it for all local authorities? Uh, do the local authorities need to have a role in this at all? 
So as you can see, we're 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 at a point where we're investigating all kinds of models. Like if you look at um, England, uh, it's a centralised model. The marine management uh, organisation do all forward planning themselves. Um, and they basically do it by regions. I think there's about twelve different regions, and they've eight of them done at the moment. Uh, so the local authorities have little or no uh, interaction with with, with uh, or sorry, little or no responsibility for planning in that regard. If you go to somewhere like Sweden, um, they have both. They have a hybrid approach, so they have a central body called SWAM, uh, well, similar to, your, to the SWAM there, but it's uh, the Swedish Water and Marine uh, area, and they work with local authorities but retain responsibility uh, for the forward planning. So it depends on the model, and I'd hope that um, the formation of government, the programme for government, uh, our advisory group, our consultation and all of those things will put shape on that. Um, because for every person that tells me that uh, local authorities are well placed to do this, there's someone who says that actually a central body is the way to go. Uh, so there's no clear cut um, uh, way to do this. Uh, there are 18 coastal local authorities. Um, if you allow, if you allow, I'm sorry to use that term. Uh, if 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 it's devolved to each local authority, will you put 18 marine planners base around the country? Um, I, I I just don't see that as a sustainable model, for instance. Um, but would you have a regional approach? I, I think that's probably one model we could look at. Would you have a centralised approach? Because marine planners are so thin on the ground. That's probably another approach we'd be looking at too. So, a long-winded answer, I'm afraid, and I don't mean to say it depends, but it really does depend on the model that comes out of implementation. At the moment, the body I represent, the Marine Planning and Development Management Team, we we are responsible for forward planning in the entire country. It may be that I, I'm talking to you again next year, and I say we're still the body responsible for all planning. Um, and in that case, you know, will I have two or three extra resources and that's it? Poss that's possibly a very realistic uh, analysis. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, is, is the is the onboard Panola, will that be the appeal body? Will it still be the appeal body? Or is that also up in the air? Um, it, well, it's up in the air, but it's dependent again on the model. So if local authorities are the ones making... Oh, actually, hold on, there's a, there's a two-part... Um, answer to that. Uh, for development management that will be devolved and some things will be devolved such as jetties and piers and all that to local authority and they will deal with those in the same way they deal with local um, housing development um, for instance. The appeal body in that regard will, will be on board Panola. Um, for forward planning um, it, and for um, strategic national infrastructure and offshore renewable energy and things like that, no, on Borpanola won't be the appeal body because local authorities won't be making decisions on those as things stand. Um, so offshore renewable energy and big projects like that, the idea will be that on Borpanola will be the planning authority for that. Okay. Um, I, I'm actually, I haven't even thought about who the appeals body would be in that case, but you could look at either the High Court or um, the Office of the Planning Regulator, maybe. Um, one of those two options would be open. But So it, there, there's a yes and no answer to that question, I'm afraid. So yes, for some of the smaller localised development management functions, the onboard penalty absolutely will be the appeals body. No for the bigger things and the forward plans, I, I would still expect, uh, um, I wouldn't expect AVP to be the appeals body. I, I don't, sorry, does that answer, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, that's fine, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Bernadette. Um, okay, so thanks a million. Um, I know we've, we've kept you after the time, we, <laughs> so I'm sorry about that, uh, but it was brilliant to have you on and thanks a million for, for joining us and for uh, giving us uh, such a, a, a good rundown on, on what's going on. Um, I think we can, I'll give you a big, big silent bull bus. <laughs> thanks very much. Can, can I just add, Catherine, cause I, I know there are other questions coming in there and if, if anybody has a question, um, just, just uh, let us know. Uh, msp at housing.gov.ie will find its way to me. And um, I'm very happy to answer any questions directly or if anyone wants to have a chat over the phone or like that, 
uh, you know, uh, very open to that. So um, if you have any questions, uh, get them to us, but please get your submissions into us. Brilliant. And that was msp at housing.gov.ie? Correct. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Thanks a million, Connor. Thanks very much to everybody and thanks for, for, thanks for so inviting me along. Cheers. Thanks. Okay.